What's up, everybody? I'm DJ Six Minute. You're watching the Sit Down. Look who's here. It's Greg Barker, director of brand new movie Sergio, coming out on Netflix. How are you, Greg? I'm good. I'm good. Keeping well in these very strange times. How are you, DJ? Yeah, it's a weird time, but I think the benefit is we have plenty of time to watch stuff, and I think people will be very interested in your film. And it's somebody that you've covered for a very long time. So why don't we start off really broadly here? Why don't you tell everybody about Sergio, Sergio DeMello and what really fascinated you about his story? Yeah, Sergio, yeah, Sergio DeMello was a uh, very interesting guy. He probably saw more war and human suffering of anybody else of his generation. He was Brazilian uh, from a diplomatic family, but he kind of left Brazil at a, as a, at a young age and traveled to Europe. Ended up working for the United Nations uh, in their human rights uh, division and uh, uh, refugee work. And ended up uh, uh, becoming the, um, the uh, UN envoy in Iraq um, in the immediate aftermath of the, uh, of the, uh, of the American occupation, which is one of our takes. The interesting thing about him was he's a world full of empathy and, and hope and solidarity, but didn't see himself <laughs> very clearly but a very complicated and, uh, and I think messy personal life. And the film really kind of unpacks that when he uh, uh, finds, you know, the woman who ends up being the, the love of his life um, and tries to make a new life with her just as he's the target of a terrorist attack in, in Baghdad and, and then kind of has to, has to assess his whole life and his life's purpose um, as he's struggling to survive. I think it's pretty interesting because somebody as accomplished as that can see and have the awareness of everything going on in the Middle East, but can't peel back the layers personally and emotionally. Why do you think he struggled so much with that? I don't think it's an uncommon struggle, actually. Mm -hmm. I think uh, a lot of us kind of grapple with, you know, balancing work and personal life. And, and, some, and you see it amongst, uh, you know, very accomplished people where, who, who sort of devote themselves to a cause, whatever that is. In his case, it was kind of saving the world. And the work can seem so important that it's easy to kind of set aside, you know, your, your personal life. You figure it'll just take care of itself. As a, you know, a journalist, as my, uh, originally I was, a, you know, I worked a lot overseas, covered some conflicts. And you can sort of start feeling that you're, you know, you're doing such important work, everything else will take care of itself. And yet often, you know, there's a balance, right? The important work is what we do inside and with those who are closest to us. I think we're reminded of that, you know, in times like this where, you know, as well, that, that what really matters in life. Um, it's both the personal and, the, and how we engage with the world. And that kind of, uh, so it just spoke to me and I kind of, you know, I, I related to it and identified with it. And so I originally made a, a documentary about Sergio 10 years ago for HBO, which is now on Netflix as well. And, uh, but I always saw this personal struggle at, as the core of his story and wanted to tell it as a, as a narrative feature. So when you think back 10 years ago to where things were in the Middle East, to where things still are in the Middle East, like what, what blows your mind the most about this conflict over there in the Middle East? Oh, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, 10 years ago, we were still in the sort of aftermath of the Iraq invasion. And, um, you know, it's during making of the movie, we, uh, we filmed it in uh, a lot of it in Jordan uh, for Iraq. Um, most of our extras were all refugees from neighboring countries, particularly Syria and Iraq. And um, it was such an amazing privilege to see, you know, our stars, Wagner Mora and Ana de Armas, um, connect uh, with these, with the extras and really feed, take from from, from them, the, the kind of the emotional um, uh, roller coaster that they've been through the last 15, 20 years. I mean, it's, uh, it's um, I love, I love that part of the world. And I've spent a lot of time there uh, as a documentary filmmaker. And it kind of breaks your, your heart. But what I want to do in the movie is often we see the Middle East portrayed in films as kind of a dangerous place. And mm -hmm. it can be, of course, but, but basically, these are people, these are people trying to live their lives. And we tried to, sell, to, to see the world, I think the way Sergio in real life saw the world kind of from the ground up, sort of seeing people for who they are, having empathy towards people, even if they're different or from us culturally or politically, to meet people as they are and try to affect, you know, respect and affect change and have dignity and respect for the, 
for people, no matter what the differences are. Yeah, just humanize people, regardless of where they come from. I think that's a really important thing. And I think it's also interesting because like we've had a little bit of time to separate from when Sergio died and we're able to learn from his story. What are the biggest things you want us to learn, you know, over a decade after he's gone now? For, for me, this film was all about empathy. Um, and, uh, you, you know, ultimately it's about how we see each other. And as I said, Sergio's struggle is he doesn't see himself that clearly, but but how do we see the uh, people who are different from us? How do we then sort of have hope in difficult times? Um, this film, the characters are, are, you know, kind of embody that, that hope. They have their struggles and their dramas. Um, and yet Sergio went out into the world and tried to inhabit what I call the shades of gray between right and wrong, good and evil, and actually just get stuff done. And I think that kind of optimism and hope amidst the darkness is, is what I take from, from this story and why, I, you know, for me, it actually feels more relevant now and not just that we're living through a pandemic, but this, this time where 10 years ago, we're still dealing with the aftermath of 9-11 and Iraq, the Iraq war. That feels a long time ago now in a lot of ways, but, but I think, you know, our divisions have uh, gotten greater, you know, and, and we have to find a way through that because that's the way problems are actually solved by, by, by finding ways of working together. Doesn't mean you have to be soft, doesn't mean you have to be naive, but you know, otherwise we're just, we're just, we're, we're not gonna find, you know, a practical way through these times. So for me, it's a story of hope amidst the darkness, really. The Shades of Grey part of it is really interesting because I think about some of your other works that you've done, like with Manhunt, with Bin Laden, the final year with the Obama administration, like clearly you run packing those topics throughout. So why don't we talk about the final year? Like what was the biggest thing you learned from that experience? Well, that's very interesting. So yeah, it was a film about the documentary with the last charting the American, the, the Obama foreign policy team during the last year in office, which did not turn out as they imagined. <laughs> 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 so, um, well, I, a lot of things, but I think the one thing that's particularly relevant now was what most impressed me filming that. Obviously, we were with these senior officials, John Kerry and Smith Power, Ben Rhodes, the president. Um, but I was really, really impressed with the next level down, the kind of the career civil servants um, who are incredibly smart um, and uh, uh, kind of could be making a lot more money elsewhere. Um, and that level of expertise that they brought to the table when, you know, the president needs to know something about North Korea or anything, you know, there's this huge reservoir of talent and knowledge inside the U.S. government. And that kind of, those people have been sidelined, sadly, mm -hmm. in the, under this administration. And I just think that's a horrific mistake because those those career civil servants will serve any president regardless of, of party. In fact, they're used to the change. Um, that's what they bought in, into. But they they also need to be sort of regarded. And at a time when we sort of need that expertise more than ever to deal with the pandemic and other big global. But that's what I learned most. I mean, it was also just to see, to be up close inside the, the kind of bubble of the, of the White House and and uh, being on these presidential trips, you know, where this huge entourage goes around the world, and then to be kind of be inside the bubble. We weren't part of the press corps. We were kind of like with the players. That was that was really, uh, you know, kind of a once in a lifetime experience. It was an amazing personal experience, and to see government up close, and then to see what happens when Trump gets elected and all yeah. that it was kind of it was, it was you know, as a documentary filmmaker, the it was one of the sort of great epic narratives that unfolded right in front of me. That's a really cool experience. Does it also blow your mind of how popular documentaries have become like the last five, six years? No, it doesn't. I think if people are hungry for, for, um, for uh, authenticity now. Um, no, I think, it's, a, it's, I think it's, it's been a golden age for documentaries. Um, there's a proliferation of them mm. now. I think for me, the the challenge is, and one of the things I found rewarding about making a narrative, is I think documentaries that are, are at all political um, are seen through this kind of divided lens that we see everything now. So I don't think the final year is a political film. I mean, we're inside the Obama White House, so of course it's their story, but it's not like 
I didn't make it out to set out to make a propaganda piece. Or same thing with Manhunt inside the CIA's hunt for bin Laden. But things are interpreted in kind of a political lens now. The thing I enjoyed about narrative is that emotion, the human experience, is still something I think we can we can tell stories that are about the world and how we experience the world from a from a uh, kind of a character point of view, a kind of a more emotional experience that are not seen to be political and um, and still speak to a wider audience. So for me personally, I feel like it's the, the documentary world, although there's a lot out there, anything that's all political, it's very difficult to kind of break through to speak to people beyond people who already agree with the film's message. It's still scope and narrative to kind of reach a wider audience, which is why I really enjoyed this. Well, I think that's the beauty of Netflix, that your narrative will reach an audience all over the world. So some people will learn about Sergio for the first time. Some people will be reminded of him. You mentioned the empathy, the people, but what are some other takeaways you want people to have when they check out your film? Well, I mean, it's a great love story, right? So it's, a, it's kind of, it's, it's amazing performances by Wagner Mora, who you, people will know from, from Narcos and, uh, and Elite Squad, other great Brazilian films. But uh, particularly as Pablo Escobar and Narcos, he's transformed himself. Um, he looks totally different. I didn't even recognize him. He looks totally him. different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 he looks more naturally like Sergio than Pablo. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope really so, kind of, right? Yeah, <laughs> I hope so. Um, and then with Ana de Armas, who is, uh, who is Carolina Lariera in our movie, who is, uh, you know, just has this extraordinary screen presence, which uh, anyone who's seen her in other films knows. But I think what makes her special is she has this, she's very grounded as a person. She comes from a very humble background in Cuba. She knows where she, she just remembers where she came from. And she brings that kind of authenticity and, and ability to connect with people to, to her performance, which is what, in fact, the character Carolina is all about. She has kind of this idealistic, she, she reminds Sergio, who at the time is kind of, kind, of, kind of losing his way, of why he got into the United Nations um, to begin with, and that change comes from the ground up to dealing with ordinary people. But it, this movie kind of explodes into this, uh, into this love story. And so beyond like, you know, the idea of empathy, it's also about how do we love? How do you, how are we true and honest to those closest to us? What's most important in life? Um, one of our department heads making it read the script and said, oh, I just had a argument with my husband. I went down and apologized afterwards. It's kind of that kind of movie, you know, it's like reminds me of like the, the movies I love when I was growing up, like You're Voting Dangerously, uh, English Patient, mm -hmm. these kinds of big films, big emotional stories, love stories set against this canvas of political change always just spoke to me. So I kind of was inspired by those, by the, that, that, that kind of movie. Well, I'm glad you had the runway to tell it. Thanks for joining us and we'll talk to you down the road, Greg. Thanks very much. Enjoyed it.